right, so welcome to the April Geometry Labs United talk. Um, I think everyone who is joining live heard Anton's spiel, but uh, this is a monthly seminar designed to kind of get people, not just students, also um, faculty uh, and staff who are working at various uh, geometry labs, which are mostly undergraduate research labs, um, to meet, talk about some cool math related to uh, what's going on in the labs or just people's research, and then also get a chance to actually meet and talk, uh, particularly as we are in this online environment. And this month's talk is by Kate Stage, who is a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and she will be talking about the geometry of number theory through the Mobius transformations, and there should be some awesome pictures. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so this is going to be uh, a whirlwind tour, but what I wanted to do is just give you guys a little bit of sort of a story from my mathematical life, where I was doing research in this geometry lab style, where I was generating stuff with the computer, I was printing it out, I was measuring things with rulers, you know, it was, it, it was really fun stuff. And a lot of um, sort of strange connections came together. Um, and I also think uh, it might be interesting because it's geometry, but it's number theory, which I think probably isn't as, as highly represented. So, um, so the story starts, there we go. The story starts with this picture. Well, it doesn't really start with this picture. It kind of ends with this picture, actually. But it's the whole story of this picture. Um, but we have to go back and start with an older question. So this is an older number theory question, which is basically if the integers are interesting, and we think the integers are interesting, right? I mean, there's primes. Um, the integers, I mean, why I think they're interesting is because we have this additive structure, which has this very regular structure we understand, plus one, plus one, plus one, all the way up to infinity. And then you have this multiplicative structure, and it's the interplay between those two, which becomes interesting. So the primes, which are what you build the multiplicative structure out of, the questions are then like, how do they appear in that additive um, number line, for example? Anyway, that just lives in the real numbers. And a natural question is, is there some analog which lives in the complex numbers? So this is an old question. The complex numbers you can, of course, form from the real numbers by adding this imaginary square root of minus one. So it's just the real plane generated by two things I'll call one and, and i here. Um, and it has an addition because you can add vectors in the plane. So we're thinking of these numbers the, the point x comma y in this picture here is x plus i y. But if you want to multiply them, it turns out you can do that too. And all you have to do essentially to build the complex numbers is add in the stipulation that when you go and try to multiply stuff, you follow your nose until you get to an i times an i, and then we declare that to be a minus one. All right, so the number line, the reals live in here on the x-axis and the integers live on that axis. And then you might ask, well, if you have this whole space of complex numbers, is there some analog of the integers in there? So the natural thing to do is um, to guess, maybe we'll take the complex numbers that have integer coordinates. Um, so that looks like this lattice of white dots here spread across the complex plane. Um, and what's so great about this choice? What's integery about this? Well, to begin with, if you add or multiply those things, you get again a complex number that has integer entry. So they form a ring by themselves. It has a zero and a one, and it's commutative. But it's also a discrete lattice, which means that just like the integers in the reals, they're spaced out evenly. Um, but it uses up the whole space. It's rank two. It's two dimensional. OK. So what would you like if they were really going to be like integers? Well, then you would want there to be primes. And you would want there to be unique factorization, then it would look like integers. And if you've taken an elementary number theory course, um, you, can, you can access unique factorization and primes and a lot of elementary number theory by using the Euclidean algorithm. It's sort of a fundamental tool that you need. And so you can ask, is there a Euclidean algorithm in this setting? Okay, so these are questions from hundreds of years ago that we've we've answered, but today I'm going to answer them with the picture. 
Okay, so the answer to that question lies in this picture, particularly the Euclidean algorithm. All right, but first I have to go back. I want to tell the story a little bit chronologically, which is that um, I had a friend from math camp when I was in high school, and we both became mathematicians. I became a number theorist. He became a probabilist, and he phoned me up because I was, you know, his number theory friend. Um, because in his research, something was coming up from number theory, and he said, do you know anything about Apollonian circle packings? And I said, no, I don't know anything about Apollonian circle packings, but it turned out I was in the Bay Area, and uh, a postdoc there, Elena Fuchs, was giving a talk about Apollonian circle packings, and this is what I learned at her talk. So an Apollonian circle packing is uh, formed in the following way. So what you do is you start with three circles, which are mutually tangent. In this case, I have two of them inside the other one. It's fine, whatever you wanna do. And then you ask the question, this question is due to Apollonius in ancient Greece, and that's where the name comes from. Um, he studied these questions. You ask, how can I add another circle, which is tangent to the three that I've already got? And in the picture, you can probably visualize where they are. There's two solutions to the problem. And in general, there's always two solutions to the problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that as a generative process. So I'm going to start with these three. I'm gonna add in these two new ones. And now I've got new triples that I could put a new circle tangent to. And that fills in the curvilinear triangles that you see with a new circle tangent to the three sides over and over and over again. And so if you do this forever, you get an Apollonian circle packing. Okay, so it's a fractal. It's something from geometry. Um, why would a number theorist be interested? Well, it turns out that if you label the circles with their curvatures, in this example, you get all integers, no matter how tiny you dig down in here. So the curvature of a circle is one over its radius. And a priori, if I just started drawing circles, you, you totally wouldn't expect for the radius to look like one over an integer all the time. And why not root two or three quarters? Um, but it turns out that once you get started and you've got integers going, it goes on forever. So there's actually a geometric reason for that. It's usually credited to Descartes, but it's um, really from the correspondence of Descartes and Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. And I think they both deserve credit for this. It was sort of generated through the correspondence. Um, but anyway, the, if you have four mutually tangent circles, so you have a quadruple where they're all tangent to one another, then it turns out that the four curvatures satisfy this particular quadratic relationship that you see here on the screen. And so what that means is, you know, it reflects the geometry in that if you have A, B, and C, so you've got three of those circles, then the fourth one, there's two solutions for it, right? Just like there was two solutions to the geometric problem. Um, and also those two solutions satisfy this linear relationship to do with the previous curvatures. So in particular, if you get to the point where A, B, C, and D were already integers, then this new D prime is gonna be an integer too. And so you generate integers all along. So then the number theorists pay attention and they say, okay, um, so what integers are you getting? Which ones? Which ones are in the packing and which ones are skipped, right? And that's an interesting question because this packing has this sort of, mm, you know, it has a, a, a fractal structure, which means it has symmetries. There's some group acting here. Um, and you'd like to understand how you end up with some curvatures and not others. And the conjecture is that in fact, it's governed by a congruence condition almost entirely. So the conjecture is that if you take one of these packings, you can set up a congruence condition mod 24 and that will basically determine whether or not your curvatures are in there. So you check, is it congruent to one of the allowable values mod 24 or not? With finitely many exceptions, finitely many small numbers might get skipped is the only caveat. Okay, so for all sufficiently large integers that satisfy the congruence condition, they will appear in the packing. And if they don't, they won't. Okay. Um, and this is out of reach. Um, we haven't been able to prove this. We uh, as a community have been doing a lot of uh, work with advanced analytic number theory techniques and so on. Um, we can prove that the curvatures have um, the ones that are, they have positive density amongst the allowable congruence classes um, and even density one. So it's like almost all of them, but we can't quite prove that there's only finitely many exceptions. Um, okay, so that's, what, that's what's going on in number theory. That's what I learned about the number theory side of things. Um, but my friend who, who had called me up, he sent me this web page that was um, that was a computer program 
um, collaboration between him and his collaborator, David Wilson. And it showed an Apollonian circle packing. He didn't tell me what his project was at first, right? He's just like, okay, here's some data. Showed an Apollonian circle packing and you could mouse over. And when you went over one of the circles, a tooltip would pop up and tell you the curvature. And you could see how the curvatures of the surrounding circles would generate the curvature of the new one and so on. But it also popped up a lattice associated to each circle. And the lattice had as its co-volume the curvature. So it would actually give me two vectors in the plane. And then I take the integer lattice, the integer span of those things. And that would give a fundamental parallelogram, which would have as its volume, the curvature of the circle. So this is just some extra, like, more of more sort of fine data than just the curvature there's a lattice with that shape that volume so um so this was intriguing and so i moused over for a long time i was writing down all of these lattices and things and figuring out and i finally figured out that you can give a recursive structure to the lattices too so knowing the lattices of the surrounding circles you can figure out the lattice of the one that's inside the solution to apollonius's problem so that's kind of interesting, but what, what, what on earth was he studying? Because he's not a number theorist, right? So where did this come from? To tell you that, I have to go back to what he was studying, which was abelian sand piles. So what is a sand pile? So it's a model, a very inaccurate model of how sand behaves, which is you stack a large number of sand grains in a tower at the origin on a square lattice. And then if there's more than four, you're allowed to topple and send one to each of the neighbors. So if I, if I started in this example with 16 at the origin, then I could topple and send one to each of the neighbors, okay? Because a tower of sand grain, a million sand grains at the origin or something is not stable. So this is the process of it falling down into a pile. So there's 12, I can do it again. There's eight, I can do it again. There's four, I do it again. Now the neighbors each have four in this example, so they can each topple. Right, And they each sent some stuff back to the origin. So now I can topple the origin one more time. And then I have too few sand grains at any position to do any more topping. Okay, so this is an abelian sand pile. You could start with whatever configuration, but the, the, the sort of simplest thing people could think of was to start with one tower of sand grains at the origin. Um, and then you let it stabilize and you ask, what do you end up with? What does the picture look like? So let's do more sand grains. So here's if you do a thousand grains. Now, instead of writing the numbers at the positions, I'm showing uh, four different colors for the number of sand grains left over because you can have zero, one, two, or three left over when your toppling is done. Okay, there's 10,000 I've had to scale out to fit it on the screen. 100,000, scaling out some more. 150,000, 250,000, 500,000. And if I zoom in, this is what I see. So what's interesting about this is that you get incredible complexity from simple rules, something like the game of life or something, right? It's some sort of situation where um, you set up some simple rules and you have this emergent complex phenomena and you ask how to, you know, what creates that, what's going on? So um, one thing to notice is that this looks like I'm just getting finer and finer detail as I go to more. There's some sort of limiting picture here, which is kind of interesting. And when you zoom up, another thing to notice is that these re it comes in these triangular regions, which have repeating patterns in them. So here's a triangle with this repeating lattice pattern in it. And here's another different sort of repeating lattice pattern right here and so on. Okay. So um, Lionel and his collaborators were studying this, and what they noticed is that you can get the patterns in some regions seem to be connected to patterns in bigger regions that were kind of giving those regions as, as um, consequences, as, as offspring or something, right? And it had the structure, you know, three things giving a fourth that fills in in the middle uh, of a Apollonian circle packing, not geometrically, these aren't circles in this picture, but sort of recursively, it was the same structure. And so this is a little bit of a, a, a mental construction here, but I put the, re, the repeating patterns into each of the circles in an Apollonian circle packing. And that's basically what they had sent me was just the, the lattice of periodicity that they were seeing in each of these regions. So it comes from a very unexpected location. Apollonian circle packings were a huge surprise in sand piles. Okay, so they've since proved this. Um, and, and they have a nice paper about that, but I think a lot of this is still kind of mysterious. Um, okay, but now I have to go back to the picture. I don't know how long I've been talking, so 
how, how, how much longer do I really have to talk here? Have I been too meandering? No, I think we're no, uh, 15 minutes in. Okay. We started late. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, so let me go back to what might be going on. So I have to tell you about Mobius transformations and I'm going to give you the punchline. Okay. So Mobius transformations are transformations. They're functions on the complex plane. And, um, one fun thing to do is visualize complex functions. And one standard way to do that is to do a sort of color wheel. So this is a color wheel around the origin. And then I have dark, like near black, near zero, and then light, whiter colors uh, near infinity. And that colors every complex number with basically a unique color. So it gives me a way of understanding the complex numbers. And then I've put a grid on here. So Mobius transformations are transformations of this form. Okay, we sometimes write the matrix of coefficients, but they're transformations that look like this. So for example, if I take the matrix, which is the identity, I get the function, which is just the identity function. And that would just take this picture to itself. It doesn't change anything. But I could do, say, z going to z plus 1 by choosing appropriate coefficients here. And what would that do? It moves all the complex numbers over by 1, right? So I could draw that as a before and after picture. OK? So that's my method of visualization. So I could do uh, plus i which means moving up. So here's a before and after, right? And the grid lines are moving with it, right? I could do times four. I can get that out of an appropriate choice of matrix. And that would scale because I'm multiplying everything by four. It gets farther from the origin, so I'm zooming in, all right? Now, I can also get rotations, which is essentially what you get if you multiply by numbers that aren't real numbers, but other complex numbers. Um, so here's a rotation before and after. And you can also get really interesting pictures. So let's do inversion, 1 over z. That's also a Mobius transformation. There's the after. So everything's turned inside out on the complex plane. And um, basically, the origin's gone to infinity, and infinity's gone to the origin. All of these grid lines are really lines which pass through infinity. And so when I put infinity down at the origin, all the lines have to pass through that. And so what would look like a straight line before is now drawn as a circle. And what's true about Mobius transformations in general is that they will take lines and circles to lines and circles, okay, always. Here's a, just some random Mobius transformation before and after. So you can see it's kind of stretching downwards. That green part is growing. Okay, so that's the kind of thing you can do. So, um, okay, so Mobius transformations tell you something about the structure of the complex numbers. You know, sort of a natural collection of functions on something that you want to study. Um, and so if we are interested, going back to my original question, in the Gaussian integers inside the complex numbers, then the natural thing to do is to ask, what if I look at the Mobius transformations where the coefficients I pick, the matrix I picked, just had Gaussian integer entries? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the real line, and then I'm going to apply one of those Mobius transformations, and it'll take that real line to a circle, some circle somewhere. And then I will take the next Mobius transformation with Gaussian integer entries and apply it to the real line and get another circle somewhere. And I will do that for all such Mobius transformations. So this is a picture of all the Mobius transformations with Gaussian integer entries. So that's what the picture is. And it should tell you something about the number theory of Z adjoin I of the Gaussian integers because you restricted yourself just to those functions. But you can also pick other rings of integers inside the complex numbers. So you could take root minus 2 instead of root minus 1, root minus 7. And they all have different combinatorial structure. You can see the fractal structure in here. You could describe it in terms of new circles generated from old ones or something. And it's different for each one. And then as you get further, they start to actually be disconnected. And they start to look like these necklaces wandering around. OK, so back to our original question. Is there a Euclidean algorithm? Well, it turns out, so after playing with these, I just played with the pictures because they were beautiful. Um, I figured out, I asked myself, why are some of them connected? Why are some of them not connected? And the answer turned out to be if there is or is not a Euclidean algorithm. Euclidean algorithm can be thought of in terms of matrices. And you can, you can turn it into a question about the tangencies of these circles controlled by the matrices of the Mobius transformations. And so the theorem is that the underlying ring of integers that I'm interested in has a Euclidean algorithm. 
if and only if the picture is connected. You can get from any circle to any other one by a series of tangents. And so as a corollary, the Gaussian integers, just by looking at the picture, have Euclidean algorithm and therefore they have unique factorization. Here's a Q adjoint root uh, minus six. This is disconnected, so it has no Euclidean algorithm. Um, and uh, if you wanna get the lattice, that I was that got me on this whole path. <laughs> it's actually the lattice generated by the two lower entries of the Mobius transformation. That's the lattice of periodicity from the sand piles. I think we don't still totally understand, and we're nowhere near totally understanding what's going on here. Anyway, I'll just end with a picture. Thank you. Questions? So what happens if you take a connected component? Does that have meaning? Yeah, that's a great question. There's infinitely many connected components and they're sort of controlled by these uh, kind of like, do you see sort of ghost circles in here that cut them out? I don't think we understand totally everything that's going on. Um, so the components are bounded by these ghost circles and the ghost circles themselves form the sort of alternate arrangement, which is a different orbit um, in many cases. And one of the things that sometimes happens is you see that one orbit corresponds to one part of the class group and another orbit is another element of the class group. But not always, it's more complicated than that. I have a graduate student who, um, who wrote a thesis on some of the interesting phenomena that you see. There's a lot of interesting questions. Hey, why does the abelian um, sand pile have to do with the bottom two entries of the I don't think I, I don't really know. <laughs> so I can prove it, but I don't understand it, right? So um, so when they what they did is they wanted to prove this recursive structure and generate the new patterns from the old patterns. And they did that with induction. I mean, they built them the new ones from the old ones explicitly and showed what was going on. Um, and it's sort of inspired and connected to this stuff going on here. Um, but like why that should be the case that it happens to be, the lower entries is still kind of mysterious to me. What's one interesting thing is that those lower entries, they generate a lattice. It's a lattice generated by Gaussian integers. And so it can, it can naturally be interpreted as a element of a class group. Why that should have anything to do with Apple and circle packing, we don't understand. Oh, and I should have mentioned since this is a GLU talk, that um, you know, this was work which I did before we started up our lab at CU. Um, but then one of the first projects that I did was having some students program the generation of these lattices and, and circles and stuff um, from uh, you know, using the recursive power and stuff. So modeling some of this stuff. Um, yeah, and we got to play with some 3D printing and things like that. I have a, I have a nice 3D printed model where they're hemispheres instead of circles and they're all nested. <laughs> so I, I was actually about to ask, what happens if we go into the third dimension? There, well, so there, there are Mobius transformations there too. Well, so the natural thing to do actually is to think of the complex plane as the boundary of hyperbolic three space living above the complex plane. And then PSL 2 zeta join i is the hyperbolic isometries of that space. And so what you want to do then is think of that as an, an analogy to the upper half plane and its modular group um, action with the fundamental regions and stuff. And then if you, if you do that, you kind of get this picture. So these are hyperbolic geodesics. It's a sort of natural thing to do is think of each of those circles as a boundary, excuse me, I almost hung up on you, of, uh, <laughs> of, the, um, uh, of the corresponding geodesic. And so these are kind of like lines, walls of some tessellation of the upper half plane or something. It's not the, the usual modular one is not the correct analogy exactly, but almost. Mm -hmm. But when you have Mobius transformations on, a, uh, on R3 itself as well, right? So you can take some discrete group of Mobius oh, transformations. Yeah, so yeah, there's several, there's several like uh, ways that you could generalize to higher dimension. One of the most, because you're interested in studying the Gaussian integers as a ring of integers, one of the most natural things to do is to go to the quaternions as the next option. And so um, Senya Shadevasser has done some work 
on that and that gives you some some cool um circle packings in higher dimension i mean sphere packings mm -hmm. so do you get the same correspondence that it's you have the euclidean algorithm if and only if uh, it's connected mm, i don't know i uh I'm not totally sure what the statement is. I don't think it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Well, shall we thank Kate again?